Once more, dear saints, please turn with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, Ephesians chapter four. We're looking again for the second time this week, the glory of our united confession from verses four through six of Ephesians chapter four. I do want to read the first six verses as we know that this is one sentence in this this section of scripture with a theme for us to, to, to live in unity. It is calling the saints, the believers, the church to a life of unity. Verse one looks back on what was said, the doctrinal treatment in chapters one through three when it begins with I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse six, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There is a a habit of the human heart and that habit is removing or adding requirements. And in this case, removing and adding requirements for unity, building stipulations for unity that are not found in the scripture. And that was something that the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones exposed in the early or mid-1900s and mid to late 1900s, and that he observed that when like-minded believers came together, They were so concerned with protecting their denominations that the subject of unity and what makes unity genuine became somewhat of an afterthought. They did it maybe to protect their high church denominationalism. Maybe they did it to protect and guard against their ancient confessions and creeds. But they were hesitant to address what real unity looks like. So without question, even though these men were faithful men, to include John R. W. Stott and J.I. Packer, as we look at these men who over the years were faithful, we can also say in another way that we too can be just as biased as they are. And so for us to to know what unity looks like, it, it, it cannot be on the grounds of our bias opinions or positions or preferences or even our history, it must be on the faithful word of God. Our unity must come from the scripture as it is revealed in the word of God. And in doing so, in learning what it is from scripture, we are exhorted to preserve it diligently, faithfully, passionately, in a world that is ready to pervert or distort unity. It was John Calvin who wrote that we maintain that men are to be united amongst themselves in a mutual affection with this as the great end that they may be placed together under the government of God. If there be any who disagree with these terms, we would do well rather to oppose them strenuously than to purchase peace at the expense of God's honor. And so without controversy, we can say that unity is doctrinal. It is of divine substance. It is not on a humanitarian level. It is on a Trinitarian level. Unity relates to doctrine. In fact, we can say that unity relates to doctrine before it translates into fellowship. Unity relates to doctrine before it translates into fellowship. 
Our unity of fellowship is a true unity of fellowship when it relates to the doctrine. And so if it relates to the doctrine, that is a unity that we're called to cherish, to love, to enjoy together. Uh, we find that to be a part of the conclusion in the first sentence in Ephesians chapter 4, where the high point of our unity is based on the triune God. And of course, leading up to our passage here in verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians 4, I'll just give a little background. The command in verse 1 begins with a call to fit your life according to the truth and live in such harmony with it. Live in harmony with the doctrine so that your confession and your conduct are united. And why is this so? The answer is because God, who called you to salvation, is the one who calls you to sanctification. And so verse 2 then begins with how, begins with a how-to of a worthy walk. It is with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And then at the end of verse 2 and verse 3, the bearing with one another at the end of verse 2 and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, it is what you should do in walking worthy. So there's the how-to and then there's the what to do. You do it how? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, and then what do you do? You bear with one another. And then be zealous to maintain unity that the Spirit gives to us. It is from Him. It is from the Spirit of God in the bond of peace. And so now we're picking up here with verses 4 through 6, and as we're doing so, we're looking at common confessions that you need. Common confessions you need to preserve unity. These are common confessions, and we began looking at verse 4 and verse 5 last week. The first common confession is that you receive the same spirit of grace in verse 4. And because you receive the same spirit of grace, we all receive it together. Then we share the same body. We share the same life source. And we share the same hope. These are blessings that we all have in common because it comes from the Spirit of God. And then in verse 5, you receive the same Savior. And because you receive the same Savior, we all share in Christ together. It says in verse 5, there's one Lord. And then we looked at the second benefit in receiving the same Savior is that we share the same convictions or common convictions. And that idea of, of common conviction is really the doctrine, the teaching. It is the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And this one faith here embodies the revelation of Christ and Scripture. And from that truth, we, we must anchor when, when it comes to unity that no other person or writing represents or instructs the faith. That's the, that's the common conviction that we all share in unity. Now, we, we may not all know what we should know. We do not all know everything. But that is why the instruction is there, so that we may know and share these truths together, that, that these are non-negotiables. These, these are truths that we cannot set aside for unity because it consists of unity. Because through the Lord Jesus Christ, this one Lord, you have the one faith, the one body of truth in its final form. And so from Scripture alone, we unite in our faith. And our unity grows stronger through the teachings of Scripture. So we must, not, we must have access to the same body of truth, and then we're all called to believe the same body of truth. We're all called to learn the Word of God together to grow through the Word of God. And it is through the teaching of the Word of God that our unity grows in strength. So if you ever see a, a situation where a church is growing in unity, where there's less theological preaching or biblical preaching, that is actually counterfeit. That is not true, sincere, God-centered unity, because it says that within this unity is this 
this triune God who unites us together to himself, and he also unites us in the truth. Our writer Jude calls this the faith that was once and for all delivered. Now granted, congregations can get together for good causes, benevolent causes, but it takes the work of the Spirit for us to unite according to the truth because it's going to cut us in various ways. It's going to convict us. It's going to sanctify us. There'll be repentance to God and to each other. But that is what this faith does, this teaching, this body of instruction that we all learn together. So the faith in verse 5 is a summation or the scripture in its totality for the local church. And there's only one, and it is the Word of God. Now, there's been some arguments that, well, the early church, the first century church, didn't have access to the Scriptures as we do. But as the Word of God was being taught from the apostles, the early church had the Old Testament Scripture. And, and in fact, that is where you get this statement in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it says that all Scripture is God-breathed in verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3. It is making reference to primarily the Old Testament and in the early beginning stages of the New Testament Scripture. But prior to the writings of Ephesians, and and even during the writing of Ephesians, you had the book of James, the churches, you had Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you had Romans, you had Matthew and Luke, most likely began circulating. And then during the time of his imprisonment, you have Ephesians, Colossians, you have Philemon, or Philemon written, and then most likely the book of Acts was being recorded. And so inspired writings and the faith and what the faith looks like for the local church was circulating in the first century richly. And this is also a defense against those who believe that the scriptures were not formulated until the fourth century, The Apostle Peter said that the New Testament scripture was being written because he actually acknowledged the Apostle Paul as one of the writers. And so the the body of truth was was shaping quite and rapidly in the first century church. Part of it was to, to push back on the false teaching, but also to establish what the church should learn and what the church should do. And so this faith was critical to have common convictions, and I'm saying common convictions from the Scripture. We can have common convictions from other things. Last week I made a reference and analogy of of creeds and and certain teachings from denominations, and many of them I have read and I still enjoy and do enjoy, but they are not the Scripture. Creeds and, and certain writings and confessions are good, but even those confessions may need to be edited because they're not inspired. So over the years, words change, thoughts become clearer, but the Word of God is is the very tool and instrument that we should use to equip the saints. And I pray you understand that. This is not a, a refusal of some of those other external sources, but they're not God breathed. This one faith is what keeps us united in true unity. It is not our confessions, this is not our creeds, those are good, but that's not what unites us. If that's what unites us, then those are secondary causes replacing the primary instrument that God uses. You know, to say that you share a common conviction with those things with others is fine, but if that common conviction separates you from other believers who actually hold to the teachings of Scripture, then that becomes a problem. So for us to really hold fast to this unity, we have to make sure that our one faith is not a secondary writing, but it is a primary and only authority for the church for its faith and practice, and that is the Scripture. And we do this because we have received the same Savior who teaches us the same truth from the same Scripture. The interpretation is a single interpretation. The meaning of the text is the meaning of the text. There's one interpretation, many applications, because that is how the Word of God is unfolded historically and faithfully. That's the common conviction that we share together. And now we move on to the third, under this second overall umbrella of receiving the same Savior, and that is you share a common testimony. You share a common testimony. It says, one Lord, one faith, this common testimony is one baptism. 
It says that there is only one. Does that mean that we had to have all been baptized in Jordan or Galilee? Is this spirit baptism or water baptism? Well, we know that water baptism is symbolic. It is a way to publicly declare that you're dead to sin and have been raised to new life in Christ. So true baptism for the Christian church is believer's baptism. Um, infant baptism is almost presumptive regeneration. It is dangerous. And I know there are many brothers that we will fellowship in different ways with who hold to it. It is a very dangerous doctrine because our Savior clearly said, as you're going, make disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and they must be able to acknowledge him. So baptism takes on a different meaning, and it took a very significant meaning for the early church. The early church did not make too much of a distinction between spirit baptism and the response in water baptism. They saw one as corresponding or a response to the other. So the reaction to being in crisis, as the Ethiopian eunuch said, where is water? There is water. What hinders me to be baptized? I've never heard a baby ask me that question. There's someone who makes an acknowledgement of the faith and who knows, repent, believe in the gospel, that baptism does not save, nor is it a seed for salvation, nor is it presumption for salvation, but is there an acknowledgement that you are now in Christ and you want to identify with Christ as having been buried and raised in new life, and you're identifying yourself with, in the first century, it was often the persecuted church. So word of baptism was a very serious Ordinance. It is one that Christ commands us to observe, and babies cannot even observe their wet diaper. More or less observe this ordinance of baptism. I say this because word of baptism is essential to the church's life and testimony. But also I would say that that is not what this text is focusing on. As important as word of baptism is not to salvation, but in response to the gospel, this is the one baptism we receive in spirit baptism. So the stress must not rest on submerging in the water, but the divine work, because I do believe that in context, in the context of this sentence, the focus is on something divine, something spiritual that affects us, and then obviously our actions of obedience it is a necessary and essential part of God's work but this is God's divine doing first, and it is saying that every Christian is baptized into the body of Christ. So this is spirit baptism, is what we would call it, where the Spirit of God, and he does this, he baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. There's no initiation, there's no interrogation, and yes, there's no application. I've always thought about that. We try to change the membership application to membership form because no one is signing up. This is not a club. This is the work of the Spirit of God where he sovereignly places that repentant sinner into the body of Christ. I used this passage before, but I think it's important to echo it once more. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I think it's good for us to look once more to, to see what God has to say about his united body. And dear saints, this, this makes an impression not only on the heart, but the action. How we respond, interact, how we engage together, how we serve together, how we live together. This seeing the, the, the Trinitarian foundation and, and thrust behind our unity it will change our perspective on the local church. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many. And so it's, it's talking about the gifts in this section in 1 Corinthians, and we'll see the giftings applied also in, in chapter 4 of Ephesians. But though we have various mem members, and there are many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And though you have many members of your physical body, 
different parts or components of your physical body, it's the same with Christ. But then the reality is this, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, ethnicity, slaves or free, or social status. There's no discrimination in salvation. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, and that is the work of the Spirit of God, so therefore it is spirit baptism. You go back to our text in Ephesians 4, and that is a baptism. And that is the common testimony. The common testimony is that God, by His sovereign grace and mercy, gave me a heart of flesh, new life, supernatural life. And he opened my eyes to see Christ, to turn away from my sin. He gave me the gift of faith to believe that Christ is the one who offered himself up for me, the sinner. And upon that truth of turning from my sin and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm immediately ushered into the body of Christ. Now, we are not saying that there was a point in time where you had a, a come to Jesus moment. And you just heard the song, All to Jesus I Surrender, and it was that specific date. But there is a recognition of this truth concerning the gospel in that you are part of the body of Christ. When you hear the gospel, the melody and the richness and the beauty of the gospel is different to your soul. You know the Spirit of God is in you. And being baptized into this body means you have a love for Christ and you have a love for the church. You have a love for the people of God. Not what they do for you, but because of what Christ has done for you. And that is a common testimony. We were all baptized into the body of the one Christ by the same Holy Spirit, and we all share the same spirit baptism. We speak about the events leading up to our conversion. It may be different, but the work is nonetheless the same. It's the same for all, that God graciously places us into the body of his Son in whom he has declared to be the head of all things and given us as a gift to the church, the Lord Jesus Christ as our head. So you share the same spirit baptism. And now in this shared testimony, this common testimony, you also live a common life together in Christ. Now, as you're thinking about Ephesians and maybe even 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and the Apostle Paul is telling the church in Corinth that we're all one in Christ because we're all baptized by the same Spirit, the one Spirit, into one body, in the bodies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you are at a church or you're a church that enjoys, you know, ranking people socially and the rich, the, the rich people in the front, or they have the seat of their choice, and, and then the, the lower class people in the back. This would come as a shock to the believers in, in Corinth. Because if you agree that unity is a supernatural work, how is it possible to use social advantages or disadvantages to judge another brother or sister? Or how can we evaluate our brothers and sisters in Christ and physical appearance when the scripture makes a judgment or an assessment based on the identity with the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, well, what makes this possible? How is it possible for us to say, well, we're meeting together every Sunday, but we do so not with a love for the church or for Christ, but with, with a love for a specific people group? Well, the answer is that whenever there's an absence of the knowledge of God, there'll be the presence of idolatry, the presence of social rankings, the, pre the presence of partiality. And so it's no coincidence that when Christ was praying earnestly for his disciples, 
And for those who will obey the gospel message in John 17, you remember this in John 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's not a small matter that you have a group of people who respond to the word of God in its clarity because it is clear. And those who will not, they will always establish conditions. They will always have this sinful bias. Their preferences are never rooted in the word of God. It's rooted in some social event, some social affair, some social conflict. And that has to do with a lack of knowledge and that lack of knowledge of who God is. And it is the presence of personal idolatry of the heart. We're not saying that differences are not there. We realize that that will be true in the eternal state, that there will be those, what we should do, celebrate those cultural differences. But when those cultural differences become a matter of conviction, that's a golden calf. That's a golden calf. The knowledge, especially in our text, the knowledge of unity and its source comes from our knowledge of the triune God and who God is. Because it is a unity of essence, which means it comes from God. It's a unity of purpose, which means it's the will of God. So if it's a unity of essence, it means that we need to know who God is, and that affects our will and it affects our actions. And that is why you go back to the prayer in chapter 1, you see the prayer in chapter 1 being so important when Paul says, I'm praying for you to know God. For without this knowledge of God, you will not unite, but you will find unbiblical grounds to separate. But as we respond to the word of God, and this prayer has an effect in our heart, There will be a zeal for genuine unity because you know God more today than you did the day before. Well, there's a picture of what this unity can do and the fruit of it. When we share in this common testimony, we delight in what God has done. I appreciate Matthew Henry's commentary just on that thought. He says that the divine unity means not only not quarreling and devouring one another, not doing these things only, but delighting in each other with mutual endearments and promoting each other's welfare with mutual service. And so it's it's a mutual affection and mutual service. You will delight in this united testimony that we're part of this family of God. We're together in him. We're united in him. We have a common conviction. We believe that the Word of God is a final authority. We love the Word of God. We love hearing the preaching of the Word of God. We love hearing the teaching of the Word of God. We also love the fact that we can actually respond to the Word of God in ways that the dead in in their sin cannot and will not. We rejoice because we have a share in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to be His bride, to receive the same Spirit of grace. We find that to be a treasure because the same spirit who unites keeps us united. It keeps us focused on what is essential. It keeps us pursuing the same thing. That is the glory of Christ. That is a solution to our disunity, either in fellowship or just in personal life. And our relationships is to realize that when Christ is at the heart of what we do, then unity is so easy. This common testimony that you have been baptized by the one spirit into the one body is because we have received the same Savior. And now to the third large umbrella, this third common confession is in verse 6. You are received into the same family. You're received into the same family. Verse 6, it says, One God and Father of all, and the reason why I said the same families, I see this as having tones of adoption, of a family in the Lord Jesus Christ, because this is appealing to believers. This is not the general God of all creation as much as it is our Father who has called us to salvation. 
And because you are received into the same family, where is one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, your Father rules his new creation. Your Father rules his new creation. I believe that this, even this verse, verse 6, echoes the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and the word Shema comes from the Hebrew word for listen or to hear. And in that passage, it says, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. And that also translates into the New Testament scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6 says, the Apostle Paul is addressing the, the church's struggle with meats being offered to idols. He wants them to know that the idols are not real, and there's only one God. He says, there is no God but one. For although there be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, and he does that in lowercase, yet for us, for the Christian for the believer, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. You notice that, dear saints? Oh, please let us not rush through this. From whom are all things and we exist for him, for whom this one God we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. We can see that verse 6 of Ephesians 4 can focus on God's complete control over creation. I believe it is not without that truth. In him we live, we move, and have our being. That is every human being. So whether you're Christian or not, God is the source. He sustains the natural order of things. It's not sustained by random activity or science. It is sustained by God who is the source of life and every living thing and of all things good. Romans chapter 11, verse 36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. I don't believe that text, as I said earlier, is without that truth, but I do assert that the, the focus and the all is in reference to the church. It is for the encouragement of the church. So it's not merely explaining God's control over creation, but it's to stir the church's passion and motivation to see that the God who controls all things is presently at work through Christ to rescue sinners and unite them in His Son. So there is a, a history in, in our life of sin before Christ, of rebellion, of resistance, of acting as if we had no creator, no authority, to now a new creation in Christ where God is the sovereign ruler and Christ is the head of the church. So the God who rules creation is the one who rules his new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Paul, in that section, in that passage, was making a reference to, to the high priority of the new covenant, that it is glorious, it's a covenant of light and life. And so in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he's saying the same God of creation, of natural creation, is the same God of the new creation. He said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory, of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, this truth they're saying should motivate the Christian to see that God's will and his counsel is at work and invest our energy in pursuing God's will and counsel that is at work. And a part of that is 
to pursue unity. And the Christian who responds to this will respond in united obedience. And this is a place of examination, dear saints, because if this God called you to salvation and submission to him to follow Christ, then this is a mirror for our own heart. And the question is, are we truly following Christ? Do we have a passion for unity God's way? Is your life progressively fitting with the doctrines you're passionate about? Because this is one sentence. So this theme of unity and and living it out and walking worthy has not changed at all. Or you may say, you know, if you only knew my sin, the reason why I don't respond as I should, live as I should, serve as I should, you just don't know how sinful I am. And my response is, I don't need to know them. God does. And he still saved you graciously. It's amazing that none of us were ever fit to be saved. And then God saves us, and all of a sudden we think that we're not fit to serve. We're not fit for anything good. It is through Christ. It is through Christ that we serve. It is through Christ that we unite. It is not ourselves. So this father who received you into his family, because you received into this family, your father rules his new creation. It's one God and father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. This is the one God who graciously rules his new creation. You are his son and daughter. And secondly, because you're received into the same family, your father works in you. Because the father who is over all, through all, and in all, is without question working sovereignly in the hearts of his children. As I said before, this can apply to creation in a general way that God exercises his benevolence over creation. But but God as Father only lives in the lives of his saints. So we can say that this God is transcendent, who rules his new creation and works his will by his power, which is true that he lives in us. I want to say this to make it clear that he lives in the church. And I think that is also another important emphasis here in this text for one reason. It is that when God saves us, he saves us into a community. The the glorious community being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then he saves us into a body with other saints. They're there as you would have the invisible church. Saints gathered from all over the world. So salvation always began with a community of people. You had the 11 disciples about 120 others in the upper room praying that the work and the life of, of the New Testament believers and the church began as a community of believers. Yes, it is true that God dwells in us individually, but more so corporately. That makes individual Christianity or personal Ecclesiology, a non-theological position. It is not biblical. And this is one of the great and glorious mysteries of God's revelation to us. That we're members, as it says in verse 3, in verse 6, I'm sorry, of Ephesians 3, 
that we're members of the same body. Members, plural, of the same one body. It is always consisting of a community of people. This is a bit of an aside, but it's necessary as we look at the text. If he's the God and Father of all who, who rules his new creation and works in us, then he's working his will in us. So for that reason, as a church, how we appear numerically is not as important as what we do spiritually and theologically, to be clear. That the church is not a place for entertainment. It is not a place for the unchurched. The church is not a place for the unchurched. The church is a habitation for God. He dwells with his people. They are his people. He is their God. And I say this unapologetically. If anyone attends a place of worship that idolizes the preacher or the congregation or the music or the style or the tight jean wearing pastor who can hardly breathe, Maybe that's why the sermons are shorter now, because of the tight jeans. If they're meeting for any other reason but for God, they are not meeting as a corporate body of believers. And that is why unity must center around a Trinitarian conviction of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to know God. It must center around that. So it's, it's never a suitable place for unbelievers. And even some believers may not find it suitable because it doesn't suit their fancy. This is a place for God. And as he's working in the church, that's why the church is always reforming, it's always changing its practices. So that as the scripture informs its practice, it wants to transform what it has done before to be more like the word of God. Because it is a habitation for God. So as you think about the God who rules his creation, but rules his new creation, who sustains the natural order of things, but also is the God who works in us, there is nothing outside of his complete authority, nothing. But dear saints, if he's given his son to be the head of the church, there should be nothing outside of his jurisdiction when it comes to the church. It's all about the glory of Christ. It's not for you. It's about you in this way. It's about you for this one reason, to make you more like Christ. It's not to make you happy. It's to make you holy. That is the Father who works in us because we're received into the same family. Now, if we have been received into the same family, we should, we should have the same love and affection from the Father who pours that out on us. Because he is God with us. Presently, God the Father dwells in us because Christ is with us by the Holy Spirit. So we have the triune God dwelling in fellowship with us. This is also a very deeply rooted in family affection. You have access to the God who created, who designed, the maker of all things, but he's also the one who ordained your salvation and has called you into fellowship with him. So he's presently abiding in us. But then there's another, and it is that because you've been received into the same family, your father works in you. He's presently working in you. He's united us together, and because he's working in us, 
He's working us to accomplish the very intent that he had from the beginning. From the beginning of creation, it was to glorify his son by uniting and reuniting all of creation in him. And who's displaying that right now? The church. But the church is not doing this personally. It's not, well, I'm the church, I'm a Christian, I don't care what all the other churches are doing. Yeah, I go to GCCLB, I'm a member, but hey, they don't want to love the Lord like I love them, so that's their business. No, it's, it's to make every effort to see that every saint is pursuing the very same goal that the Father's pursuing in them. He's working in us, he's living in us, he's ruling his new creation. What does this lead to? It produces what the scripture says. In chapter 5. Verse 18. Ephesians 5. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is the debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. In God working in us, living in us, is so that he may fill us with himself. And how does, how does he do this? He does it through his son, Jesus Christ, who has been given to the church as his body. Ephesians 1.23, the, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That he's filling the church with himself to fill the church with himself is that the church is learning who Christ is, learning who God is through Christ, and becoming more like Christ. You will see a church, when you see that church learning and becoming more like Christ, not just the learning, but the becoming. Part of the goal in teaching the believers the word of God, teaching them the words of Christ, letting the words of Christ dwell in them richly is so that we will attain to the unity of the faith. We know that the ultimate unity of the faith is, is in the future, but we are still working towards this progressively now. And of the knowledge of the Son of God in verse 13 of Ephesians 4, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ is filling the church with himself because that is God's will. And as the church is full of Christ, it is full of the knowledge of the Father. And as it is filled with the knowledge of the Father, it becomes strong and mature, and it builds itself up, and then it's able to pursue biblical sanctification and humility and for the glory of God. So being received into the same family speaks of the Father who rules this way, but his ultimate goal is to fill us with Christ and to fill the entirety of creation with Christ in the future. And the church is the beginning. The church is the beginning of that final phase of God filling creation with the glory of himself through Christ. And this is, this is an awesome task. It's a humbling task. And you say, well, we're not fit for this. It's not being fit for it. It's that Christ fits us for the task. If we're spending less time learning him and being more like him, then the task is going to always be overwhelming. And you think about it. As the world continually gets worse, and maybe over the last few years it's, it's escalated, maybe over the last year or the last few months we've seen an escalation of it, is that it's easy to become overwhelmed with the sins of this world when we're not overwhelmed with the glory of Christ. Let me just put it this way. And take this as personal as you can, because this is, I would say, a broad generalization. That as a whole, the church itself is, is deficient in its knowledge of God. There's, there's almost an overemphasis of everything else but knowing him, and I'm saying intimately. The application of that truth to the heart and life. There's a very, there's a high esteem for the general ability to, to parse and to interpret, but not necessarily to probe the heart. And so in today's society, there's a lack of this knowledge of, of this gracious Father who is doing all things for his glory 
the glory of his son and for our good. And so this brings us right back to the centrality of God's intent before the foundation of the world. And the church gloriously receives it and participates in it. It's so that through the church, in verse 10 of Ephesians 3, the manifold, the the multifaceted, the many-layered wisdom of God the multi-layered wisdom of God might now presently be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. It is through the church. And as the church pursues this biblical ideal that reflects the true Christian harmony, that we're supported by the foundation of doctrinal truth, that that serves notice to the authorities in the heavenly places. So, well, the church isn't doing a good job of that. I think the, the rulers in the heavenly places can't see that. Well, that's our myopic or narrow thinking. Oh, it's, it's being heard. As in some part of the world, if it's not GCCLB, Grace Community Church of Long Beach, if it's not through us, it's through other churches that believe in the supremacy of the scripture, the supremacy of its application to the heart and the life, and submitting to the total will of God for our lives, that it is not about us, but it is about the supreme glory of the Father through his risen and exalted Son. And that as believers, we we see a, a distinct honor to be a display that this unworthy sinner you have called to salvation to participate in something so vast and so great, Would you actually call me? Are there not more qualified people who will represent you, Father? He called you before the foundation of the world. Even though at times you may not look like the best representative, I may not be the best representative at times, but he calls us with supreme confidence in what his son has done. And saints, may I encourage you to submit to this work that the Son has done, that if God has united you in Christ, you're part of the body, then see this opportunity as something glorious. Strip your life of all of the world's ideals and and the world's pleasure. I mean, there's some creature comforts that are good, but other creature comforts that are killing us, that are not rooted in the Word of God at all. Let this be your comfort. That this is eternal. You you have the blessing of displaying before the authorities in the unseen realm, that is. You don't even know what they look like. That this is God's wisdom through the church. But he says, so that we'll know that this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in verse 11 of Ephesians 3, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the confidence of God's plan rests in his son. Now let me ask you another question. Are you confident in that plan? And is that your zeal? Is that your goal? Say, so, well, I, I think I do, but I have other goals. Okay, are those goals willing to die to this one chief aim? Are you willing to, to slay these ambitions to be a part of this? It may call for you to, to serve in a foreign country in missionary work. It, it may call for you to give up personal possessions. It, it may call for you, as it does in salvation, to surrender everything you have so that God may use it at his disposal. Because you want to be a display of God's work, his wisdom that he ordained and planned through Jesus Christ, his son. And in this age, the church should be a representation of this for the world to see. I think that this, when we grasp this doctrine of unity, 
And we see that genuine unity is Trinitarian by design. When we see this, and other believers, our prayer will see this, that we no longer, we will no longer pursue unity on, on social levels. We will see this as something supernatural. That is my prayer for you. That is my prayer for the church at large. That God will awaken the world and even America, especially America and United States, to see that unity is Trinitarian, not humanitarian. It is supernatural. It is not social. It is divine. It is supreme. It is glorious. It is pure. It is true. But yes, it will cost you. It will cost you. But to align yourselves with a gracious Father who has given you his spirit and his son offered himself up for as a sacrifice, it's a small, small response. The great thing that God has done. I do want you to reflect on this. Think about your, your convictions that you have and evaluate if your belief about unity is in harmony with the triune God. Consider that. Is your belief about unity in harmony with the triune God? They're not divided. They're not arguing. They're not fighting for, for social equality. There's something great at stake, and it is the unifying of all creation. There was one commentator who said that we are no more at liberty to be schismatics, divisive people, than we are to be heretics. And I was saying the flip side of it, we, we are no more at liberty to form false unity than we are to be heretics. If your unity is not based on the Spirit of God, the unity of the Spirit, and its foundation is not in the triune God, then yes, you have built an idol. And America is building many Unitarian idols. It's becoming a religion all its own, but this unity is divine. It is glorious. It's for the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. It's not for the glory of man, it's for the glory of God. It's not for the advancement of temporal causes, it's an advancement of an eternal cause. The Christian is called to align themselves with this unity, and when they do, they are walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. Pray with me. Our gracious God in heaven, please shed light on our way so that we will not be distracted by the principles in this world that are satanic, attacking the glory of true biblical unity that right now you are working in the heart of your people. Sanctify this church family. Give us an affection for Christ, for the glory of the gospel, for true harmony that can only come from a life that has been changed, that can only flow from the new birth that comes from you. Let this church and other churches hold fast to the unity that will last. It is the unity of the spirit that one day eternally there will be a perfect union between the saint and their savior, a complete subduing of creation, when the final enemy will be swallowed and that enemy is death, when the saints from every tribe and every nation and every tongue will give glory to the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. His name, Jesus Christ, is the one who brings us to you and unites us and reconciles us to you and to each other. Let that truth Never leave our thoughts and our affections 
In his name and for your glory, I pray, O oh Father. Amen.